We welcomed the news of the Baltic Fleet's multi-day campaign in the southern Baltic as a holiday, although in such a campaign everyone, especially the commanders, would have a lot to do. There would be no time to think about rest and sleep. As the campaign began, its first day had passed. The chief of naval forces, having rearranged the ships in another order, having approved the route of further campaign and exercises for the night, left the bridge of the battleship. The flag officer moved after him. You stay on the bridge. Wake me up at six o'clock. With these words, Viktorov went to his cabin. That's it. Why did they leave me on the bridge? What should I do? No instructions. I spend the night then on the running, then on the signal bridge, recording, as I see fit, the progress of the ship's performance of various signals and manoeuvres, observing the picture of the campaign. I was so engrossed that I did not notice how the first ray of morning dawn shone, and after it the waves, crashing against the board, rumbled louder and more cheerful. Battleships swaying slightly, with their powerful breasts, were breaking the waves, which were covered with violently hissing foam. The ships of the guard could not fight off the mischievous naughty girls. They pelted the low-sided ships from bow to stern. Shaggy, low-flying clouds seemed to get tangled in the ship's spars. It was beginning to be a gloomy morning of a new day on the Grey Baltic. Going into the navigator's cabin, I cast a glance at the flagship navigator fleet VVA, Dobrovolsky, A. Dobrovolsky, who was plotting the course of the ships at sea, how he manages to depict all this on the map with the finest pencil. It's time, however, to wake Viktorov. I'm in a hurry. Opening the cabin, I see that he has already shaved and is going to the bridge. Uh, how are things up there? I give him my notes reporting the marching order and our place for 6.0. Then I follow him to the bridge. The ships have been awakened. Duty on the headquarters reported to the chief of naval forces about all the events of the night. Viktorov immediately began to give orders. All night destroyer Engels did not observe the established distance, and now instead of twelve cable meters kept at a distance of twenty, on a bearing of ten degrees more, can't you handle him? Raise the call signs of the destroyer angels with cannon. So as soon as the call signs on the rack reached the place, a blank shot rang. The chief of naval forces loudly announced his dissatisfaction with the actions of the destroyer. Transmit to the destroyer Yuritsky. I draw your attention to the poor discipline of darkening. In one of the starboard cabins for a long time was not closed porthole. Light was burning. The guilty party is to be punished. Comrade on duty. How did the destroyer Kalinin act in the watch? Not bad. Not not bad, but excellent. Raise the call sign of the destroyer Kalinin, and the signal flagman is satisfied with the actions in the patrol. So the chief of the Baltic Sea Naval Forces with a firm hand brought order. By twelve o'clock the day had broken. The clouds dispersed. The clouds thinned. The autumn sun was pleasantly warm in places sheltered from the wind. The shores had long ago disappeared. The navigators were shooting the sun with their sextons, determining the place in the sea. The signal show your place at 12.0 was raised on the Marat. That's a comrade Andreev, who Bravolsky addresses me. You would you mind writing down some bearing in my book? With pleasure. At exactly 12 o'clock the artillerymen will measure the distance to each ship with a rangefinder, and you and I will take the bearing and get an accurate picture of the marching order. Knowing exactly where we are, we'll be able to determine where everyone is. Our data will be compared with the data transmitted from the ships. Ships guarded by flag signals and patrol searchlight reported their places. The fleet's navigator carefully plotted them on the map. Most had discrepancies within normal limits. The destroyer Kalanin showed its place absolutely accurately, and the left-end destroyer transmitted data according to which it should be on the bow of the battleship Paris Commune although in reality was on the left traverse of the battleship in ten cable meters. Having looked at the chart, Viktorov ordered transmit by semaphore along the line. I set as an example the navigational service of the destroyer Kalanin, which showed the most accurate place, to the left-end destroyer to transmit. Your place was on the bow of the Paris Commune. How do you like it? The day passed without adventures except for the fact that Viktorov ordered the entire command staff of the ships to practice astronomy in the afternoon, and by sunset to report the names of the best and lagging watch chiefs. Mikhail Vladimirovich, Kareev turned to Viktorov, aren't you taking the watch chiefs into the navigator's turn? It's nothing, it's useful. We are rarely on the water, we have to save fuel, so every hour of the trip must be used with maximum load and benefit, 
A real sailor should know astronomy perfectly. Foreign ships, especially oncoming ones, having seen the Baltic squadron, tried not to interfere with its movement. Only fishing vessels continued to do their hard work, daringly crashing into the line of oncoming warships and causing a lot of trouble to the watch service and commanders with their actions. Gee, the day was fading away. Twilight was descending. When the ships were enveloped in the night haze and the first stars appeared in the sky, the chief of naval forces left the bridge, briefly throwing me. You stay. I went to my quarters. Wake me up at five zero zero. What beauty is all around? Everywhere you look our ships are going with running lights on, but the flagship lights were turned off and immediately all the ships disappeared from sight, plunged into darkness, not a light anywhere. Two hours without lights. Then Marat turned on the lights and as if by magic red, green, white fireflies came to life all around, on all ship. It's the flagship navigator, who came out of the deckhouse, asked me to take a bearing on the ships of the starboard guard, himself bearing on the port side. I give him the data, he's plotting it on the chart. It's not bad, it's not bad, they're all holding their positions well. Now do they do it? I involuntarily burst out. It's not easy, comrade future navigator, good training of drivers and helmsmen. The former perfectly keep the speed of the machines, the latter, the set course. And I can tell you in confidence, people on destroyers have a sharp eye, though the night is dark, but they can distinguish in the darkness not only a battleship, but also ships of much smaller size. That's the way they do their service, sir. And if they know how to see, they know how to locate. Having learned about my intention to enroll in special courses of command staff improvement in the navigator's class, the flagship navigator began to involve me more and more often to help, to write down the time and counts of the taken heights of stars, or to work with a sextant. It came to the point that he allowed me to plot on his route chart, though with a barely visible line, the bearing for determining the place on the coastal signs. Viktorov saw our alliance and did not hinder it. At night in the navigator's cabin, some special business-like coziness. The ship's clock ticks frequently, the lag counter clicks evenly, counting the distance travelled, the gyro compass course indicator sings its song, the automatic course plotter buzzes busily, the habitual navigator's ear detects the slightest changes in the ship's course and speed by the rhythm of working instruments. On a small table on an electric stove is a kettle. Navigators, especially at night, do not mind to indulge in tea. A glass of hot navigator's tea, as they say, of extraordinary strength, drives away sleep and fatigue. It's past five o'clock, soon to wake up the commander. Suddenly the door suddenly opens and Viktorov appears in the deckhouse. So much for wake me up at five zero zero. I give him my notes. He reads, coming to the navigator's table, lit by a darkened lamp. Where are we? The flagship navigator points to the map. And the attackers, according to your calculation, where, I see, turn off the running lights, battle drill. Once again, the ships melted into the darkness. The night attacks began. In the eastern, brighter part of the horizon guard engaged in battle, from the darker part of the horizon enemy attacked battleship. One of the attacking ships broke inside the guard and, having marked a missile torpedo salvo, abruptly turned around and disappeared behind a thick smoke screen he had put. A spectacular sight. Right down. The attack was well executed. Who was so dashing? Yuritsky. Marat exchanged call signs with him during the attack. Now praise the bridge service for their diligence. Thus began the third day of the campaign. We're getting farther and farther south. It's noticeably warmer. The wave has decreased, the wind has subsided, and in the afternoon it became calm. There are rare cumulus clouds in the sky. Watching the ships through binoculars, Viktorov walks around the bridge with a satisfied look. Obviously, his navigator's soul is rejoicing. I could sleep for an hour or two. But stay on the bridge. You'll call me before you turn back. But sleep continues to overpower me. As soon as I lean on the railings, lean against the bulkhead, I feel myself falling asleep. Fretting, I went into the navigator's cabin. There was a kettle on the table. I was tempted. I just started to pour tea into a glass as the ship's navigator entered the cabin. I involuntarily blushed. Don't be embarrassed, you would have done it long ago. The navigator encouraged me and immediately passed to the chief petty officer of helmsman, Golonikov, henceforth for the flag have a third glass. So I was counted among the navigators and got the right to all their tip privileges. 
Earlier I was not fond of tea drinking, but since that memorable day, or rather memorable night, and to this day I like to please my soul with navigator's tea, during the war we were often saved by it. If you drink a cup of it you won't fall asleep for four hours. By the end of the campaign I was really exhausted. I went to the cabin to wash up, sat down on the bunk, and I don't remember anything else. Woke up. Quiet. Can't hear the propellers running. So we're standing still. Why? What happened? I jumped up, rinsed my face under the faucet, opened the door and ran nose to nose with Stoliarov. Seeing my worried face, Peter immediately clarified everything too. Viktorov is asleep. He ordered me not to wake him up until he wakes up. He was looking for you. He was very angry. But I told him you hadn't slept for six days. Why is that? He was surprised. On your orders. I gave no such orders to Andreev. Mm. Comrade Chief of Naval Forces, I said. You left him on the bridge for the night, so he, by his inexperience, stayed there all night. It was good that the navigators cheered him up with tea, or he would have fallen off, the weirdo even earlier. I didn't know. I didn't know. In that case, let him sleep in four hours will be at the Grand Raid of Kronstadt anyway. Did he really just sigh? Let him sleep? She exactly so, not otherwise. And you, brother, you can sleep. You went to bed yesterday at about 15.00 and today the flag was raised half an hour ago. So you set a record by sleeping for 16 hours in a row. Say in the winter of 1928-9 year in the fleet, there were notable changes. Students of the front school began to be more boldly promoted to command positions. The most capable became senior assistant commanders of destroyers, graduates of the special course of the Naval Academy such as I. K. Kozhanov, K. I. Dushanov, C. S. Stolyarsky and others, trained as XOs, Gordy Ivanovich Livshenko commanded a destroyer. At Leningrad factories built new submarines, patrol ships. Naval aviation received new airplanes. At the Fort Crenshlot phased the first division of torpedo boats Type G, commanded by former senior navigator Marat V. Zevolodshirny. New coastal defense batteries were created. The period of restoration of the fleet was over. The period of its construction began. Every month the chief of the Baltic Sea Naval Forces visited shipyards. Being with him everywhere, I gained knowledge. My outlook was expanding. Commissar Dobrozrakov was right. You can see farther from the top floor. Satanzi Zatan's Mushet Marat was put in repair at the plant. The chief of the Baltic Sea Naval Forces began to keep his flag on the battleship Paris Commune, commanded by K. Samolov, a highly educated sailor of extreme austerity, who put a lot of work into the new ship's charter. The crew feared him more than the senior assistant, but also respected him for his commanding qualities. Punctuality down to the smallest detail was, if not his nature, then certainly the main feature of his character. In the winter of 1928-39, I was intensively preparing for examinations for special courses of improvement. Still, my dream was the navigator's class. Therefore, I wanted during the upcoming summer campaign to use all the opportunities and to become proficient in navigational matters under the guidance of the flagship navigator of the fleet. The ships of the fleet again had a big campaign in the southern Baltic under the flag of People's Commissar of Defense Climant Efremovich Voroshilov. When the day of the beginning of the campaign came, the destroyer brigade went forward, as in the previous year. Now it was commanded instead of Makarov, who left the fleet, very experienced sailor Vinogradsky, who won universal respect for his tireless work and attentive attitude to all the personnel of the brigade. Under his skillful leadership, the brigade became an excellent connection, on which the commanding youth, having received a wide road, began to grow rapidly. Following the destroyers, led by the cruiser Profinton, dropping anchors, battleships left the Grand Raid. K. Voroshilov raised his flag on the Paris Commune. At the request of Voroshilov's adjutant, I prepared in his cabin everything that was required. It must be said that Kliment Efremovich worked with papers and documents for a long time. Toward evening, the wind began to strengthen. Paris Commune, though, had a lining in the bow of the ship, improving its seaworthiness, still did not escape the font the splashes of which occasionally reached the bridge. The closer we got to the exit from the Gulf of Finland, the stronger the wind and the higher the waves became. The storm was playing out in a big way. The bridge began to receive reports that water was flooding the lower cabins through the embrasures of the mine artillery. When, having left the bay, we were heading south, our battleships with good stability began to scoop up water, pouring it from side to side. 
Any movement on the upper deck became dangerous, especially October Revolution was in trouble, which with its wedge-shaped nose burrowed into the wave, taking on hundreds of tons of water. This had never happened before. The storm grew stronger and stronger and reached almost hurricane force. The ships reduced their speed. On the Profintern broke the lifeboat, on one of the destroyer's disfigured combat searchlight, on another washed overboard cage with me. Battleships chattered so that on the bridge could be kept only by clinging to the planking. Everything that previously seemed motionless in the rooms, deck houses, cabins, came to life, moved rapidly. In a word, the slightest mistakes in the preparation of everything in the camping way were reflected. As the reports from the ships came in, Victor Roff grew more and more gloomy. He measured the bridge with heavy steps, often visiting the navigator's cabin. Finally, the chief of the naval forces asked, What does the flagship navigator think? We'll have to lie down into the wind. Otherwise, he'll make more trouble. Well, estimate the rendezvous point, where we could gather and calmly wait out the storm. Report what course we can follow there. In about three minutes, the navigator invited Viktorov to the map. Do you suggest this point? Or maybe it would be better here? I'm sure that the first point will be better in all respects and closer for everyone. All right then, first is first. Transmit an order through the duty officer at marching headquarters. Get a receipt from each ship to be sure of acceptance. Announce new course. Signalers started to work with their searchlights. Radio operators tapped the keys of radio transmitters. The ships laid down on a new course leading to the rendezvous point. At once it became easier, so the rocking decreased. It was dawn. We together with the commissar of the ship, Keshots, ran along the leeward side of the upper deck to the stern to see what was going on in the cabins. Everything was normal in Viktorov's cabin. The diligent messenger had locked all the drawers of the cabinet's desk and bureau. He wrapped everything inclined to move independently, razors, ashtrays, vases, in towels and put them on the bed. Stolia, Roth and I were in a terrible mess in our cabin. Chairs, night shoes and my weekend boots floated on the surface of the water. The drawers of the closet and the desk jumped out of their nests and were ready to dive into the warm waters. My notebook with integrals and the wisdom of higher math was also floating in the water. Peter was not in the cabin. He was on the worst terms with the rocky weather and was fleeing from it. I fished out everything that was free-floating, closed and secured everything that was necessary. I walked down the lower deck to the bow of the ship. Warm water walking everywhere. The bilge men, the commanders living in the cockpits, are pumping, scooping, squeezing water, remembering the storm in all the declensions of sailing times. Having reached the bridge, I reported everything in detail to Viktorov. Soon Klimenty e. Fremovich appeared on the bridge accompanied by Commissar Kesyots, shaved trim simply, as they say in Russia, a young man, but with a stern and concerned expression on his face. Hmm. Comrade Viktorov, where are we going? To you to the north. And how can we go to the north? We should go to the south. My comrade people's commissar, the storm forced us to change course. I decided not to disturb you. My comrade Viktorov, the regulations are the same for everyone. As people's commissar, I'm obliged to know all the conditions under which the fleet operates. Klimant Ivramovich paused for a moment and added in a calmer tone, that you change the course is obviously right. You, sailors, know better, but order is order. Some time later, after everyone had gathered at the planned meeting point, we continued the trip. We reached the necessary area of the southern Baltic, where we replenished fuel and fresh water from tankers and moved on the way back, clinging to the eastern shore. It's going along the coast of Germany, by morning we approached the Danzig Bay and laid a course for Jardinia, a breathtaking picture when battleships, cruisers in the guard of destroyers enter the bay. Rangefinders continuously report the distance to the Hale Lighthouse and the port of G. Denier. All ships rehearse the signal to change course. Flagship navigator report. Zix a cable meters left to the turn. Monterey People's Commissar. Permission to lie down on a new course. Viktorov appeals to Voroshela. Mem permission granted. Down signal. Commands Viktorov. Certain all ships simultaneously make a 180 degree turn. Voroshilov, seeing how clearly the maneuver is made, with pleasure remarks. It's excellent work. It's a pleasure to watch. Now I understand that the Navy service also has its own romance and beauty of labor. We were not lucky with the weather. There is a storm, then the swell is so bad that the destroyers, 
going lag to the wave can almost see the king posts. But everything else was interesting and instructive. During this campaign, all Baltic states could see for themselves the power of the Soviet fleet in the Baltic Sea. There were, of course, some unfortunate mishaps, but still the People's Commissar of Defense departed from the fleet not with a bad impression. It was the last campaign in my flag secretary life. The chief of the Baltic Sea Naval Forces approved my candidacy for examinations in the navigator's class. And so the exams were passed. Thirteen of my classmates and I are enrolled in the navigator's class. I hand over the cases to Klykov, who graduated from the school a year later than me. I warmly bid farewell to Pyotr Stolyarov, with whom we became good friends. It is sad to part with friends, with any useful business, with any necessary work. Navigator's class. Those such an order in the Navy, those who served on ships for at least two years were sent to special one-year courses of improvement of command staff or specialization. During this period, the young commander could choose a specialty in which he wished to improve, to the order, to put it bluntly, not without resonance. That is why in 1929 the courses were staffed mainly by us, who graduated from the front school in 1927. Usually winter and spring were occupied by theoretical training, and summer and autumn, practice in the specialty. Those who graduated from the advanced training courses were officially called class specialist. The head of the course was Rybaltovsky, and the commissar was Glukochenko, who knew me from Pubalt. Obviously, that is why I was again assigned to edit the wall newspaper. Our navigator was again a P. Jedremovich, just as lively, with sparkling chapters, witty and restless, except that his hair, without thinning, acquired a silvery tint. All of us were pleased that it was him who headed the navigating class. Chen. F. Rybakov, the same one who sailed on Vorovsky from Murmansk to Vladivostok, a navigator of high class and a great teacher, was engaged in navigational sciences with us. A new discipline, tactical navigation, was taught by Vezevolod Chernyshev, former senior navigator of the battleship Marat. As in the school, the deviation course was taught by Sergei Ivanovich Frolov. He was assisted by our favorite laboratory assistant Nikonor Ignatievich Shurianinov, now noticeably aged. He met us as long awaited wherever disappeared dear to his heart children. At practical work, Sergei Ivanovich gave us puzzle after puzzle, believing that it was the type of deviation puzzles that we would have to deal with in life. We had to study a lot in other subjects as well. Tinting the wall newspaper to make it more operative, at least one article was updated daily with a small, brightly colored sign attached above the title. New, this was inculcated. It was noticed that most of the students, having undressed in the check room, before going to the classroom, necessarily stopped at the stand with the wall newspaper. A monthly literary magazine was published under the editorship of teacher Kuznetsov. Days, filled to the brim with work, flew so fast that we did not notice how spring came, and with it the hot time of exams. After them, the summer practice for us navigators was to begin on Lake Wanega in Petrozovotsk and in Wongarsk, Tyvonen Solovyev Ladinsky. In a word, e.e. all those to whom Jedremovich during the voyage in 1925 predicted navigational career passed the exams most successfully. For lack of ships for practical works on deviation, we were provided with a small tugboat of Shevinik type. The head of practice, Shestopalov, after a little thinking, put the magnetic compass nacelles on the deck, and uh, no, fix it here, here is the diametrical plane, they fixed it, checked it, it's exactly in the diametric plane, Mel, how did you manage to set the compass so accurately, we asked, if you gain experience as I had, you will be able to do it yourself, and to tell you the secret, I set it exactly on the mast and tugboat's chimney, as you can see, no trickery, no tricks, one thing is important, to have a good navigator's eyesight. Some the tugboat in Kronstadt, we were engaged in practical deviation operations for more than a week, and the same amount of time was spent on familiarization. Also in Kronstadt, with the Naval Observatory, Time Service and Hydrographic Service of the fleet, well, to give us at least some idea of the peculiarities of sailing in Skerias, our class in June was sent to Petrozavots, where by that time there should have been a messenger ship Dozeny, which used to serve the royal yachts. Nowadays it was commanded not without success, and with pleasure by Leonid Grossman, a former admiral of the Tsar's fleet, who taught maritime history at our school. On a river steamer we started our journey from the Oktinsk Bridge, 
We travelled along the canals of almost Peter the Great Times then. After waiting out the fog, we entered Dalwanga Lake. Suddenly it turned grey. The wind blew up a decent wave, and our dull boat was swirling, shaking as if in a fever. Wongo decided to prove that it is not a good joke, and whoever has not been on it has not seen any sorrow. Petrozavodsk of those years was an ordinary provincial town with wooden two-storied houses and unpaved streets. It had the only metallurgical plant dating back to Peter the Great Times, many timber exchanges and sawmills, and a cathedral visible from the distant surface of the lake, which should rather have been called a sea. The military commandant sent a horse-drawn carriage for our luggage. We loaded on it the navigator's belongings, our suitcases, and it moved up the hill under the supervision of Nikana Ignacevich, and we walked along the side of the road called the sidewalk. We were accommodated in a brick three-storied school building, from the windows of which we could see the shore of the bay and the mountain devil's chair. We ate at the military unit next to the school. We could not get used to the army ration, according to which in the morning, unlike in the navy, we were supposed to have hot food in the form of some, mostly millet porridge, called conda, despite all the efforts of the army cook. The first two days were spent on equipping one of the classrooms for working with nautical charts, a room for a warehouse of navigational equipment with the proud name Laboratory of Navigational Affairs, and turning the third classroom into a wardroom. In order to maintain order in the rooms, the Institute of Day Watchmen was formed, without releasing them from navigational classes. Anyone who was found negligent to the duties of a watchman was fined 50 kopecks. The money was deposited in the wardroom treasury. In sunny weather, we were engaged in coastal astronomical observations. We made a hydrographic survey and measured the territory and water area of the port, then about 10 miles of the most rugged coastline, and two six-hour yawls delivered for us. We passed up to 20 miles a day. The schooling we had received at the preparatory and higher naval schools came in handy. A lot of time was required for processing of astronomical observations and camera processing of survey materials. Even Nikonor Ignatyevich sometimes persuaded us to go for a walk in the evening. The watchman has arrived. Tomorrow morning we will leave for Waniga Skerries. We had no other scary area. We were sent to Waniga Lake to get practice of Skerries navigation, to get a good hand at describing fairways, following the recommended courses. We had to look for and sketch natural channels, notable places, everything characteristic that can ensure safe navigation in the absence of navigational fencing. The work was interesting and exciting. More than once we remembered Gedrimovich's words about how it is necessary to see the coastline with a navigator's eye, not to miss anything. We worked only during daylight hours. At night we anchored outside the recommended fairways not to interfere with the ship's traffic. After dinner we did not leave the wardroom for a long time. We listened to stories of the head of practice Lepko about how he had sailed in the scaries, and Grossman, who in the school seemed to us an odd old man but in reality turned out to be a very interesting man, a great storyteller. Landscapes in Skerries are very peculiar. An infinite number of small, large, humped, flat islands, bald, bare-headed islands, as if they had just surfaced. Some of them had time to cover their bald spots with grasses and bushes, and the very ancient ones bristled with dense forest, blossomed with colourful mosses. In the mirror water clearly reflected and granite rocks and forests, and unknown were the clouds running. It is so quiet that if a leaf or a blade of grass falls, you can hear it. On the bridge you can hear the measured breathing of the working bottom, the clanking of the stoker's shovel, throwing coal into the voracious boiler furnace. One could hear the cooks fiddling with the impressive copper pots and his prods to the galley worker. Everyone on the ship began to talk in a low voice, as if afraid to frighten away this shy silence. We reached Kijam before dinner and froze amazed by the unprecedented beauty of the wooden cathedral. The commander heeded our requests. We anchored as close to the island as possible. It would be sacrilege to pass by. We climbed and examined everything possible. Those who could sketched it. Misha Soloviev, the only one from the pass who had a camera, made a lot of pictures. After Kizhi we had Shlishkera, then clear water, and we arrived to the final point of our route, to Bear Mountain. In those years it was really a bear corner. In the settlement at the post office, a telegram was waiting for us. It was necessary to return urgently to Leningrad, as there was a foreign voyage to be made to be made. The news was as pleasant as it was unexpected. In Leningrad it became known that for navigational practice, since no long-distance voyages of ships of the Baltic or any other fleet were foreseen, 
we would have to make a trip around Europe on one of the transports of the Soviet merchant fleet. Such were the times, such were the opportunities. It is now for the practice of cadets built magnificent ships, equipped with the most perfect, accurate and finest navigational instruments. Our Soviet fleet has become truly oceanic and systematically visits hundreds of foreign ports. Well, in the early 30s, military navigators had to undergo the practice of sailing in distant seas and oceans on civilian ships. Then it became known that we should be on the transport Volkovstroy, not later than the day after tomorrow morning, and even better, tomorrow evening. We were informed about it by the head of the group going on a foreign voyage, political officer Vomishenko. We were extremely saddened that Nikonor Ignatyevich would not be with us. There were, by his efforts, all necessary navigational aids were put in three special boxes with locks and latches. Two chronometers were placed in a separate small box padded inside with felt and velvet so that the chronometers were not exposed to shaking and external temperature. Smudge Piner with the property and our suitcases, accompanied by Nikanor Ignatievich, left in advance for the commercial port. And we, after words of advice from Rybaltovsky and Lukachenko, got to the port by streetcar. At the berth the sea vagabond Volkovstroy, recently purchased at the Sea Cemetery in America, was finishing loading timber, dirty and unassuming. Displacement a little more than 10,000 tons. It was puffing its chimney, and its cargo booms were pulling from the wall of the berth bundles of excellent, as they say, shulks without a hitch and a hitch. Lumber and stacked them on the upper deck almost level with the spar deck, so that we had to descend from these boards on the gangway to the room allocated to us under the half bank and our crates could only be lowered by turning the timber gold and infuriating the loaders, who had to restack the lumber. It turned out that there was nothing under the half-bank except the sanitary unit, our cubicle, the bosun's cabin and his storerooms. We liked that. One bad thing. With kettles and tanks for food it is necessary to get through stacks of boards and then to descend almost on a vertical ladder to deliver at least a cistern with a second course, not to mention borscht. The cistern man needed the agility of a circus performer. That's in calm weather, and in a rocky weather, it's hopeless. But life forced us to do it, so we learned circus skills. We delivered food even in storms, without spilling borscht or salting the seawater. We kept our chronometers together with the ship's chronometers. On the big navigator's table we got a place for navigational laying. We kept our navigational watch changing every four hours. Not even two days passed as everything was rubbed in and through the watch helmsman, who saw how we worked. The rumour went around. Navigators are strong in navigational matters. Gradually we won the right to life. Daily, if the weather allowed, we were engaged in astronomical observations. The boson, seeing how in the zone of his domain we were working day and night with sextons, letting them out of our hands only for the time of solving the problem, if not with respect, then certainly with approval looked at our labours. Then on the first sunless day we, having found picks, began to beat off the perennial rust of waterways, and then having asked for steel brushes, scrubbed them to a shine and dried them. The buzzin recognised us as worthy lads. And across the Malachite North Sea, having passed the cyclone and passing along its edge, and approached the port of Newcastle upon Tyne. We are perplexed why we do not enter the port but stand as well as two other transports on the roadstead. Navigator, called the captain of the Volkov Stroy, Karklin. How much time is left till full water? Three hours and ten minutes. So we'll have time to have lunch before the port gates open. The tugboat won't come for us before then. What's a gate in a harbour? We can't figure it out. Well, we'll live, wait and see. Having paid tribute to the creation of the ship's cook, everyone hurried upstairs. The binoculars passed from hand to hand like a baton. A tugboat appeared from the harbour gate. When it came, it took our ship by the nostril and, smoking furiously, led it to the port. At first, Vokovstra helped it with its car, and when there were five hundred metres left to the entrance gate, it stopped, handing over its fate completely to the tugboat. The harbour area was divided into several harbours, each of which had its own sluice gates, only less massive than the main entrance gates which had the task of protecting the port in a storm from the fierce waves. This was so all over England, except where there were deep water rivers that allowed ships to enter even in the lowest water. We used to think that dockers were labourers who worked on the docks repairing ships, 
In England, a docker is a longshoreman at a commercial seaport. After going through customs and border formalities, the crew was allowed to communicate freely with the shore. The town of Newcastle-upon-Tyne is small. As it usually happens in other countries, the central part of it is more beautiful, more comfortable. The outskirts where the working people live are not well maintained. The houses are smoky, resembling one another. People live a hard life there. It is rare to meet someone with a smile on his face. Children, left to themselves, play on the roadway of narrow streets. We saw a strange moving structure in the city, with the light hand of our classmate Fadeev dubbed this Nevadal bus tram. Later we learned the real name Trolleybus. Every day by the beginning of the working day, exactly as many cars as the dockers had time to load during the working day, were delivered to the two railroad tracks laid along the pier. Moving loaded and empty cars was done by one port worker with the help of hydraulic spikes and a rope with a hook. Everything was done quietly, without any noise and commotion. During the period of almost two weeks' stay, each of us, having chosen in the store the woolen fabric he liked, had time to order a suit. When the orders were made, it became known that the Volkhofstroy was going to London to receive sugar. We all sighed bitterly about the disappeared opportunity to buy the outfit in London itself and not somewhere else. To refuse the order would have meant losing half of its value. We couldn't afford it. In London, the Volkhofstroy was put on the Thames below the city, near the Black Boy, on two barrels like many other ships. It was possible to get ashore either on one's own dinghy or for a fee on a carrier's dinghy. Barges with cane sugar were brought up to the Volkhofstroy and the dockers got busy loading. The cargo assistant of the captain accepted the cargo and watched over the order of loading works. All the days of anchorage in London we visited its sites. We admired the treasures of the National Museum. This true pride of the British visited the Naval Museum on a sailing ship on which sailed and won Admiral Nelson in the town hall at the Royal Palace during the changing of the guard in Hyde Park. One evening, when we were sitting on the half-bank, smoking Kepston from our pipes, the usually silent Mikhail Soloviev suggested, In two or three days the sugar epic will be over. Shall we go to the Zero Meridian? At the same time we'll compare chronometers and determine their corrections according to Greenwich precision time clocks. What do you think? The proposal was universally welcomed. Besides, a lot of people had run out of the currency fund, and there was nothing to do in London without it. The next day, without exception, everyone went to Greenwich. The observatory is like a castle. It is surrounded by a high stone fence. Near the entrance on the fence, a huge dial with a second hand, according to this clock, as it was explained to us in the observatory, and to make a comparison of the chronometers we brought. Here there is a proposal to celebrate a historic event, our stay on the Greenwich Meridian, which literally lies under our feet, proclaimed Hevenen. Dear Sasha, you forgot about the dry law declared in our fraternity, reminded someone. Let me finish, begged Hevonen. Document it. To do this, ask Misha Solovyov to use his camera. Always ready. Stand on the meridian in a group and without lean faces. While we were standing on the meridian, Solovyov managed to click half a film. Then we photographed the track of the Mikhailovs, Datsyuk, Kulikov and Solovyev, on the lawn under a mighty oak tree. The photo was called Bears on Greenwich. From London our way lay to Copenhagen. Volkov Stroy was to take the cement kiln for the Novorossiysk factory and other cargoes. Having accepted a pilot in the strait, we entered the port in the afternoon. Already from the deck of the transport one could notice the amazing neatness of the whole territory of the port. No sooner had the customs officers and border guards completed their formalities than laundresses appeared on the ship. Our underwear was the work clothes of stokers. It was embarrassing even to hand it over in such a form. When the bosun saw us writhing about, he strongly recommended that we should not hesitate to wash everything dirty, down to our socks and handkerchiefs. Nowhere in the world do laundry better than here, he assured us. Two elderly laundresses were invited into the cubicle. Each of them wrote down the name of the surrenderer and what exactly was given to the laundry. Three days later, we received the laundry in a splendid stick. White shirts starched, all holes sewn or darned, all buttons and hooks sewn on. When we asked him where the Soviet embassy was located, the first day not only gave us a detailed answer, but also escorted us to the door. We liked the Danes very much for their friendliness and friendliness. At the embassy, we were met as relatives. 
They help to arrange excursions around the country to visit museums, places of interest, connected us with public organizations in which there were many people who knew Russian and wanted to be volunteer guides. Sending us on a road trip around the island, the families of the embassy staff prepared a lot of sandwiches, gave us thermoses with coffee and cocoa. We were very impressed with the magnificent National Gallery, castles and palaces, the old fortress and much more. The extraordinary care with which the fields and meadows were tended was astonishing. The highways in many places were neatly planted with garden flowers along the sides. Everywhere, especially in the cities, there were thousands of bicyclists, from ancient elders to children. Everyone was riding bicycles, leaving them unattended in special racks at the edge of the sidewalk, at stores and in squares. The evening of the meeting with the Soviet colony was always memorable. There were songs and dances, poems and stories, and wonderful tea with jam and all sorts of sweets, cookies, buns, cake. We were asked with unquenchable greed about the motherland, about everything, catching every detail, the smallest detail. People did not get tired of listening to us, poured us with more and more questions. Having taken necessary cargoes, having replenished food stocks with fine Danish vegetables, meat, dairy and fish products, we left Copenhagen at night with the expectation to pass the most troublesome part of the English Channel in daylight. The North Sea met us with a lot of choppiness, torn clouds, through which the sun only occasionally peeped through. We patiently guarded the windows in the clouds to take the heights of the sun. Alas, such windows were few. We helped the bosun and crew to clean the ship's hull from rust. When we approached the English Channel, these works, they were too noisy, stopped. Visibility decreased. Fog came. The Volkov Stroy with hoarse bass of its whistle sent the sound signals, which are necessary in the fog. There is no voyage more disgusting, exhausting all the strength and nerves of man, than sailing in fog, and especially in the English Channel, where simultaneously and along the strait and crossing it in all directions between France and England move hundreds of ship, no reference points except for the shouting ship horns, in the chorus of which you need at every moment to be able to isolate the most dangerous for a safe voyage. The ships have additional observers, forward lookouts are located at the ship's stem. All the ship's superiors associated with ship navigation are permanently on the bridge, where even conversations go in a low voice. But be that as it may, we passed the strait safely, though we were five hours behind the estimated schedule. Next on our way lay the outlaw Biscay. Rarely did anyone manage to pass through this gulf of storms without getting bumped and getting bumps. The XO, the bosun, and the sailors once again and again check the reliability of fastening all cargoes especially deck cargo. The cement kiln alone is worth a lot. Folk in in Copenhagen, before going to sea, made a detailed report on the peculiarities of navigation in the English Channel and the Bay of Biscay. There's a good chance of getting into a storm. And what do you think? Biscay shook us a lot on the huge ocean quicksand, licked everything that was even a little bit looser fixed, washed all the cracks, persistently trying to look under the tarpaulin covering the cargo hatches a little mischief in the living quarters. He hid the heavens behind low clouds, depriving us of any opportunity to indulge in astronomical practice, but still he let us through to the Strait of Gibraltar quite graciously. This was, according to Captain Carklin's assurance, a rare grace. Apparently, to commemorate such an event, Carklin heeded our requests and set a course closer to the Gibraltar coast, so that the port and harbours, the impregnable rock, and all the sights were clearly visible. Having seen enough of Gibraltar, we all began to study hard again. We needed to catch up, to have time to complete the standard number of tasks, which was the main measure of practice. The first half of the night was stellar, and we continued to work hard, fleeing from the stifling heat of the cockpit. We settled down here on the upper deck for the night. In the night many of us woke up. In the pitch darkness lightning was shining all over the horizon. Before we knew it, it was a real tropical downpour and so it was every day until we reached the Aegean Sea. There, the weather happened all kinds of things. Sometimes the sea just spoiled us with its mirror-like surface of extraordinary blue. We exceeded the norm a long time ago. Not only that, we managed to help the crew to bring Volkov's Troy to a decent appearance for Odessa. Our ship was already entering the Dardanelles as a dandy, washed, cleaned, painted and well-groomed. The crew was happy, and the bosun was the most satisfied. His face was smiling. Here is Istanbul. We anchored. Carklin went to the Softog Flot Agency. A barge with water and provisions was brought on board. 
The ship is being boarded by dozens of traders who came by boat. You can ask them anything you want and it will be delivered. We had to fight off the traders with fire hoses. It worked. They kept their distance. Two hours later, the captain returned in the darkest mood. Instead of Odessa, Vokovstroy goes to Poti. A barge with coal and Turkish loaders was brought on board. Our ship was immediately covered with coal dust. All the labors and efforts of the crew were lost. And here Vokovstroy is already going by the Bosporus, angrily smoking. Having said goodbye to the pilot, we enter the Black Sea and, sticking to the southern shore, follow the set course. We arrived in Potty without any adventures, but what to do next? We have neither money nor travel documents. We barely scraped together enough to send a telegram to our superiors. Of day later we received a reply. The first passenger steamer to leave Sevastopol, where you will receive further instructions, thanks to the captain of Volkov Stroy, who entered our situation. We were fed and fed until the arrival of the passenger steamer, and a kind-hearted cook gave us a sack with food for the road. For more than three days we waited in Poti for an opportunity. Finally the steamer arrived. Fomichenko went to negotiate with the captain. With great difficulty he managed to persuade him to take us on board. We were given one four-bed second-class cabin. In it we will store our belongings and we will go as deck passengers. Nothing, we'll endure it. It's a warm time. Tea and the rights of deck passengers, we fenced our sovereign zone with cables on the right spar deck, almost in the middle of the ship. It was convenient. Lie on the bare deck and admire the beauty of the Transcaucasian and other shores. By evening Fomichenko gathered us in the cabin. There is a thing with meals. Sir requires a deposit. I offered him to take my suitcase as collateral. He won't take it. I had to agree to pledge the navigator's property. The boxes will be sealed with the captain's personal seal and deposited with the cargo assistant. I asked the captain to inform Sevastopol about our arrival. So we were taken on allowance in the ship's wardroom. Back on Volkhovstroy, there was a party meeting devoted to the results of navigating practice. Fomikenko, as a group leader, thoroughly analyzed everyone's work. In Leningrad, we got three days for personal business. First of all, they washed themselves in the bathhouse, then slept well. And in conclusion, we told our wives, relatives, friends, and acquaintances about everything we saw on the other side of the border, about how we lived on. On the appointed date we came to the course, we were invited to a solemnly decorated classroom. Rybaltovsky read aloud the order of graduation and gave us diplomas. Glukoshenko said a heartfelt farewell. In the formation office, everyone received a leave ticket and a prescription where to arrive at the place of service. My prescription read, Battleship Marat, to the position of junior navigator. Finally, I will serve on a ship. In the second half of November, after a vacation, having stowed some luggage in a small suitcase, through Oranienbaum I arrived in Kronstadt to a new place of service, on the battleship Marat. It turned out that the battleship was in the dock. I got there. The old boy is standing there, shrinking as if from the cold, with extinguished furnaces, frozen bottoms, with a ruptured belly. They are changing the underwater hull plating. Maratish, thy friend, always cheerful, strong, but now, like a seriously ill man on the op Staying at the dock for repairs does not decorate the ship, and the crew is gloomy. Have you ever seen a ship under repair singing, dancing, watching movies? I never have. At the dock the ship is dead. Everyone is in a hurry to do the necessary work, to breathe life in. During dock work, food is cooked on shore in camp kitchens. All sanitary matters are also done on the dock wall. From rivets, drills, hammers, there is such a rattle as if you were sitting inside a huge iron pipe, and sledgehammers of different sizes were pounding furiously on it. In all the passages on the deck there are dozens of air hoses. The ship is entangled in a web of temporary electrical wiring. You can neither pass nor step in peace. I ask the watch command. Where's the commander? No commander, the chief navigator is in charge. He lives in the cabin next to the military commander. I left my suitcase in the watch commander's cabin and went to introduce myself to the senior navigator A.A. Romanovsky. My knock on the door was followed by a loud answer. May, hey, come in. Mesikenrad vice commander, junior navigator Andreev arrived at your disposal. Hello, comrade Andreev. Have a seat. My name is Andrea Adamovich. I sailed in the Pacific as a navigator on the Admiral Zavoilo, now the Krasny Vimpol. 
you'll be introduced to the personnel of the navigating unit by Chief Petty Officer Galonikov, the commander of the helmsman's section. Do you know him? Absolutely. All the better. You'll have to command the personnel of the small sector group. You'll take the personnel of communications, torpedo boats, household staff from the appropriate specialists. Your quarters are in the warm corridor next to the mess hall. Take things, people. Get into the situation of general repair. I ask you to follow the equipment of the lag shaft and the central navigational station, where the newest electric navigational instruments and gyro compass Sperry guts, the last masterpiece of the American company Sperry, will be installed. All instruments are under your supervision. Although Marat was in a long repair at the factory, a huge part of the work was carried out by the ship's personnel, stripping off rust, old paint, cleaning the hull by hand with iron brushes, priming with driftwood, and in tanks with cement. These very labor-intensive and infernally difficult works fell on the shoulders of the crew. TR all forces were thrown on cleaning and painting of holds, interbottom compartments, external underwater hull. We worked in two shifts, twelve hours a day. Each combat unit received in addition to its rooms located above the second bottom and neighboring interbottom compartments. They had to be handed over ready before leaving the dock. The work was accepted by Maritov Spilgegod and Chief Petty Officer Maidanov. He could not be fooled. Not a single mistake could escape his experienced eye. Housekeepers presented a number of rooms for delivery. Maidanov rejected. They had to do the work at off hours again. They held a Komsomol meeting, at which the defaulters were wiped with sand. Some were brought to Komsomol responsibility. Between the services included in the group of small sectors, organized a competition for the best quality and early completion of work. Together with my subordinates, I am breaking rust and old paint with all my might. And so every day, all hours of the shift, if any of the guys allowed carelessness, negligence, fellow workers immediately took him in such a turn that the second time such a thing was not repeated. Without commanders knew how to instill how to behave and work. It is very important to educate a person to be responsible to the team. Secretary of our Komsomol organization, Commander of the Department of Signalers Paramonov in the work was not tiring, did everything with passion and diligently. His example was the best school. To encourage the guys, I joined him in the competition. I had to puff and sweat a lot, but the power of example worked. The task of the day was always exceeded. At last the docking works were finished. Icebreaker and tugboats broke the ice in the harbour and brought the ship to the big ship fairway. The battleship moved to Leningrad at a slow pace. The weather was frosty and windy. The navigators every ten minutes accurately determined the place. Formerly the icebreaker was responsible for the conduct, but the commander of a warship must always be ready to take all measures to ensure safety. We entered the Neva. It was a short walk to the plant. The whole difficulty was to be able to approach in the ice to the wall of the plant, if not in close proximity, then at the distance of the gangway length. This operation Vadim Ivanovich, helping the icebreaker with the machines of the battleship, performed brilliant. Working with alternating strokes of the left machine, he managed to disperse large ice flows, interfering with mooring, in short not only surprised and experienced sailors, but also caused admiration of the whole crew that took part in the manoeuvre. There came the most intense period of repair, which, together with mooring tests, should be completed by April 15th. Each combat unit had a lot of work to do, especially the engine crew, artillerymen and our navigational unit, where everything had to be done and there was a little over four months of time and the amount of work was enormous. Gardenization work was being carried out on the ship. New, more powerful steam boilers were installed. The room of the first boiler room was now being converted into a ship's club. Such luxury was not on any ship. All means of communication, all electrical navigation equipment, all artillery fire control devices were completely replaced. Central artillery posts, navigational posts and survivability posts were re-equipped. The bow of the battleship was given a more seaworthy outline and one and a half meters high half bank. Maritol covered with scaffolding, reconstructed the command and long-range post, the place of the main caliber fire control. The three-legged bow mast was reinstalled. The chimney of the first chimney was remarked the chimney itself having risen to two-thirds of its height bent sharply towards the stern. Thus, hot gases were diverted away from the range finders. All posts, cabins and deck houses in the area of the foremast were re-equipped. In the turrets, as well as in the navigator stations, 
Everything was remodeled. The old was replaced by the new. The ventilation system of living and service premises was strengthened. There was an infernal rumble from dry riveting of ventilation pipes. Everywhere something was drilled, screwed, cut off, increased. More than a thousand workers alone worked on the ship during each shift. The crew competed for the repair work to be done in high quality and ahead of schedule. The topics of party and comsmol meetings were repairs and preparation for the summer campaign, study and mastering of new equipment coming to us. Naturally, all issues of the multi-circulation newspaper were devoted to it. I, together with navigational electricians, are on round-the-clock watch at the factory, where there is testing of gyrocompasses sent by Sperry's firm. The American side is represented by an experienced engineer. Not everything goes smoothly at the test. In a special stand, simulating the rocking and dynamic wave impacts, the praised Giro compasses are struggling. Their technical indicators do not correspond to the conditioned. Especially scrupulous was the observation of navigator electrician Detyarev, just released from the training unit. His comments often stumped the American. Irritated and nervous, he began to argue in broken Russian that Detyarev is not a sailor but an engineer and a very good specialist. Three months of testing went on and we managed to get the company to hand over the compasses to us in strict accordance with the specifications. Anatoly Petrov, the navigator of the Black Sea cruiser Kresny Kavkaz, who later became the head of the Naval Academy of Shipbuilding and Armament named after A. N. Krylov, arrived at the plant after us. We have devoted Petrov to all the subtleties of the American gyrocompass test. No matter what work was performed on the ship, the crew did physical exercises every day. The exercise was done immediately after waking up, under the guidance of petty officers, experienced physical trainers. I was present without fail. One outstanding admiral of our time used to say, how the wake-up and physical exercises would go, so would the whole day on the ship. All experience of service can confirm the deep rightness of these words. When enlisted men and petty officers were done with exercise, the whole command staff, headed by the commander of the ship Ivanov, under the guidance of the battleship's physical trainer, began only heavy rain or blizzard could prevent it. The very fact that the ship's commander punctually, daily engaged in physical exercise, had a tremendous disciplining effect. Once again I want to emphasize that the power of the commander's example is enormous. If he is respected, he is involuntarily imitated in everything, even in manners and dress. In turn, by setting an example for his subordinates, the commander gains and strengthens respect for himself. Often the commander's youth, especially those living in the warm corridor, after lights out gathered in someone's cabin, most often at political officers Polyakov and Didenko or in the cabin of the commander of the movement group Kamensky. Today our company came together for a light. I was late doing newspaper business and came in the middle of a dispute. What to do with the bilge of the right refrigerator? Pretrishchev is a first-class specialist, a master of golden hands. He knows the ship perfectly but he's a phenomenal netter. He dives into the bilge underworld and you can't find him there, says Kamensky. The best curer is the brig at full speed, suggests my cabin mate, artilleryman Vasily Kondratiev. My dear Vasyar, we tried full speed, but he got angry and started doing even worse tricks. Why bother with him? Write him off and that's it, says Vasilyev resolutely. It's a shame, replies Kamensky. Petrish Thurf is a well-read guy, the first in political classes. When he wants to, he will do everything in the best possible way. I don't know what to do with him, how to protect him. A growth disease. Slizkoy, who had been silent until now, retorts. What year does Petrish Thurf serve? Say a growth sickness is there. Elementary lack of responsibility to the team. Not growth, but backwardness of consciousness. Intervenes in the conversation to Denko. Matryshev is in his fifth year of service. Kaminsky clarifies. Well, definitely a growth disease. Does not give up Sliskoy. I think the root of the evil is that the guy has long since mastered his specialty perfectly, can do more, and he is not given. You see, a man is able to create, but has no opportunity. I propose to make him the master of the right turbine cooler. It's a gamble, who objects Kaminsky to entrust the repair and management of the refrigerator to such a person. Slisky's proposal has a deep meaning, though of course the risk is considerable. Aya summarizes Dima Polyakov, a well-read, erudite, very delicate man, who does not throw words into the wind. His opinion is always listened to. 
Nothing you're right, Dimer, agrees Kamensky. I'll think about it. Petri Schwarz appointed master of the right refrigerator. He gave his word to finish the repairs no later than at the beginning of the second quarter, and suddenly began to put things in order with a firm hand. He worked like a man possessed and did not give anyone a break. The progress of repair of the right refrigerator was set as an example for others in the ship's newspaper. Kamensky couldn't be pleased. Sliskoy was rubbing his hands with pleasure and every now and then modestly reminded. Whose idea was it? The right refrigerator was the first on the ship to finish repairs. Petrushchev stayed on for overtime service. He deservedly became chief petty officer. Later in mature commanding years, I became convinced of how important it is to notice the growth of a man in time and give him the opportunity to prove himself. It is in the constant striving to achieve more, the law of forward movement, the law of perfection. More than once in my life I remembered the instructive example of Bilge Petrishkov. The cultural chief of the ship was the House of Education, which occupied the former Yusupov's palace on the Muika, not far from the second Baltic fleet crew. On the Komsomol line the pass with the youth of the House of Enlightenment established good ties. Shings guys from our unit were there at evenings, at Komsomol meetings. Not so long ago we gave a promise to their next meeting ahead of schedule to fulfill the work on upholstery and painting of premises. The appointed day was approaching, and the end of the work was not visible. The evening hours began to arrive. On the very day of the meeting everyone worked like a man possessed without rest. We could fulfill the task only in the evening, when the bosses had already started the meeting. Two with the secretary of the Komsomol organization Paramodov, hastily washed and changed clothes, almost running rushed to the streetcar stop. Squeezed into the car, on the move jumped off at Potsaluva Bridge, flew into the hall, where there was a meeting of Komsomol teachers. Seeing us, the chairman said, Although late, but the sponsored ones have arrived. There is a proposal to include them in the presidium. We voted unanimously. As we walked through the hall, we could not understand why many people, especially girls, were looking at us perplexed and smiling. See, the agenda was exhausted. It remains only to listen to the sponsees, proclaimed the presiding officer. The floor is given to the commander, comrade Andreev. Our unit promised to report at this meeting to its chiefs about the early fulfillment of the task of the command. B, I began. On behalf of the personnel I report, an hour, or rather an hour and twenty minutes ago, we finished painting all our departments. The work was done fifteen days ahead of schedule. Please excuse us for being late for the meeting. We couldn't show up without fulfilling our obligations. Well done, guys. You can see how they were in a hurry. All their faces are covered with dried freckles, became a voice from the last row. Laughter, applause, everything mixed up. To approve the message made by Comrade Andreev with special satisfaction. Friendly, cheerful applause. That is the end of the meeting. Then everyone finds something to do according to his abilities and tastes. The circles are working, the cinema hall is open. Our appearance at the chiefs in such a comical form was a subject of friendly jokes for a long time. Especially often Dima Polyakov played a joke on me, but I could not be seriously angry with this good-natured guy. I will say, by the way, that Dima regularly overtook me in signal production, and I, no matter how hard I tried, could not overtake him in the speed of receiving signals with a signal lamp. It was not for nothing that Dima was the first of the political officers to be allowed to keep watch at anchor. In each combat unit, the amount of repair work performed by the personnel was great, but it was especially great for turbine drivers. Busy with the repair of the main engines, they did not even start stripping paint and priming the huge engine compartments with dusting. In a friendly circle, Kamensky lamented that he could not think how to make the repair of machinery and premises. Obviously, in the wardroom of the chief petty officers, this problem was also discussed more than once. Once, probably on the second or third day after the end of painting works in our rooms, after dinner, Galaunikov and Paramonov came to my cabin. I asked them what they came with. Proposal quite is not embarrassed, but step and solid, as befits a super enlisted with ten years of experience, began Galaunikov. We consulted here with Paramonov W. Machine operators are sewing up. Can't we help them? You, Galaunikov, you know very well that they will not let us near the turbines, because in their business we, except for bring and toss, know nothing as well as they in our compasses, gyro compasses and other navigational wisdom. 
so we're not talking about turbines, but about other things that are handy for us. B inserts paramon. And what could be handy for us? To help the drivers to repel the paint. Almost in one voice replied both. Well done. Great idea. It's worthwhile. Exactly worthwhile, rejoiced Paramonov. We can start now. All the tools are there. Volunteers in abundance. Let's go to the cockpit. Let's consult. Everyone's already gathered in the cockpit. Apparently, they were waiting for our arrival. Nagalonikov, tell us the essence of the case. Why should I tell them? They already know everything. Galonikov smilingly answers. They themselves suggested. Go say to the bosses and report. Well, if that's the case, let's work. The work here is not ordered, but voluntary. Who wants to help the drivers? Raise your hand. To forest of hands. The parliamentarians can't hide their satisfied smiles. To start with, five people will join me in upholstering the vestibule. No more. We'll get in each other's way. Tonight and Satamsis, Pixis, clattered with machine gun shot, beating off the paint. No sooner had we got into the excitement than the shout of the turbine operator on watch came from Who authorized you to make such a mess? We are in order to help, cheerfully answers Paramonov. Get out of here with your help. Not paying attention to the yoke, we continue to work, poking fun at each other jokes. Suddenly the door of the vestibule opens and appears Kamensky. Who's being unauthorized? What kind of help is this? If a piece of paint gets into an open turbine or a disassembled valve, you'll be in trouble? The guys of our group volunteered to help in any way they could, seeing that you have a lot of things to do. I be I thank you for your comradely help, of course. But tell me, dear comrade Andreev, if the machinists with their wrenches came to your gyro compasses to help, what would you do? Nicking Kint out, of course. That's right. But taking into account your good intentions, we will not drive you away, but ask you to stop working for the time being. We'll report to our superiors about your noble impulse. If they allow it, we'll be good. You are good guys, true comrades. The machinists won't forget it forever. Thank you. Let's go, Volodya. Let's report to the bosses. I got a slap from the bosses for anarchism, but they still allowed me to work. With our light hand mutual aid, born, so to speak, in the thick of the people, went out into the wide open. It made friends and united the whole crew, which with the greatest tension and enthusiasm worked on the repair, and then worked on the combat organization of the ship. In combat training, despite the long stay in repair, we even managed to surpass the battleship October Revolution, and in some indicators, such as navigational service and artillery, to win prizes in the fleet. Says communists and Komsomo members were the soul of all affairs and undertakings. At the party meetings the shortcomings and their culprits were openly named, all good suggestions, and there were many of them, were warmly approved and put into practice. Everyone worked with pleasure and enthusiasm. The life of the ship, its interests captured entirely. They were the most important thing for everyone. It was only a shame that there was always not enough to keep up. It was necessary to work only to the fullest. Difficult? Yes. Although it was possible to go ashore every other day, many were there much less often. Wives or future life partners naturally complained. Some even went to the dangerous edge. But whatever the difficulties of life, duty is above all. The ship is above all. And look at the wives of sailors on May 1, when the beautiful Merat stood on the Neva River at the bridge of Lieutenant Schmidt. With pride they showed their children the battleship, and with what warmth they talked about Pankin's service on the biggest, strongest, most beautiful ship of the Red Fleet. Together with the workers, the navigational electricians laid numerous cables to all the electrical navigation instruments. These instruments were installed in both combat deckhouses, on the central navigational station, on the aft ship control station, on the fore and aft bridges and in the tiller compartment. Installation of all electrical navigation instruments was carried out with the obligatory participation of sperrists, as navigational electricians were sometimes called. Thanks to this, they knew perfectly the entire electrical wiring system, which was especially important when repairing damage in combat. In addition, the electricians also studied the instruments themselves. The navigator's cabin and especially the central navigator's post were equipped perfectly and even cosy. Everything was placed rationally. Everything was at hand. This is the undoubted merit of the senior navigator Romanovsky. Having transferred people to my direct subordination, the senior navigator had little interest in their education. 
The most important thing for him was knowledge of his specialty, fulfillment of his duties. However, as life showed, Romanovsky was not only an excellent navigator, but also an excellent organizer in the sphere of his specialty. If only we, on the Marat, twice a day received a complete weather report transmitted by Germany, France, and England. So the data of more than 600 stations were plotted on a weather map. A weather report was drawn up and forecasts were given, which at first were justified by about half, and then by more than 90. One day the artillerymen were going to conduct caliber firing. The exit was scheduled for the early morning hour. They received the weather report, put it on the map, analyzed it, and Romanovsky reported to the EXO. It is not expedient to go out. There will not be the necessary visibility. Nevertheless, the exit did take place, but it was not necessary to shoot. There was no visibility. After this incident, the gunners believed in navigational forecasts. Frankly speaking, I began to understand meteorology only on the Marat, the preliminary forecasts which I reported together with the weather report to Romanovsky. At first did not look much like reality, and the senior navigator often disagreed with them. Then, having gained experience, I began to achieve better results. I no longer had to blush, and sometimes even managed to defend my point of view. But all this was later, on the voyage meanwhile the end of the repair was approaching. In the cabin above my bunk, the builders had installed an excellent folding drawing board. A simple thing, a board, but what convenience. Now you can work with maps in the cabin, draw in the cabin too. How not to remember with a kind word the builders, who penetrated into the labor of the junior navigator. It's the last decade of April. The crew is mainly engaged in painting works. They paint cabins, cubicles, corridors, cabinets, everything above the deck. The port side is also being painted. Premises, cars and posts. Everything is washed, so there is a general uplift. The factories rejoice at the end of repair. We are doubly happy. The repair is finished. Finally, we will start sailing. With the commander of the department, Lavrentiev, we are working on the May Day issue of the ship's newspaper. We type, lay out and manually print it on a flat printing machine. I knew Lavrentiev from my service in the Baltic Fleet headquarters, from the Komsomol organization. He was a printer by profession, a highly qualified specialist, a hard-working and neat person. Under his guidance, I quickly mastered the typesetting register. Three days before May 1, Shaw Cranes removed all the factory property lying on the upper deck. Tugboats arrived. At the signal, take your places, anchor and moorings off. Everyone took their places, watching part of the crew in formation on the port side. On the wall is a crowd of workers seeing us off. The XO gives the command. Release. So as the third boats harnessed the ropes, the orchestra started playing. On the shore, on the slipway, workers are waving caps, hats, handkerchiefs, shouts are heard. Hurrah! The Maritovs are waving their caps, saying goodbye to the workers, among whom there are many who used to serve in the Navy, to their friends from the factories, whose labor brought the ship back to life. Soon our handsome Marat became just below the bridge of Lieutenant Schmidt by two barrels. As if on signal, crowds of Leningraders gathered on the bridge, on the embankments of the Neva. On the eve of the holiday, garlands of solemn illumination were hung on the ship. After the flag was lowered, it was tested. The sight is marvellous. Light bulbs outlined the whole silhouette of the battleship. The board, turrets, fighting deck houses, superstructures, chimneys, both masts, and between them, as if in the sky, hangs a huge five-pointed star with a hammer and sickle in the middle. It was May Day. The crew lined up on the upper deck. The commander and the commissar go around the formation, congratulate them on the holiday and on the completion of repairs. Solemn raising of the flag and colouring flags plays the band. At the signal command to disperse, others ran to the tank, the unspoken ship's club, the so-called buck bulletin, and many stayed on the upper deck to admire the sun and dressed up the city. Guys, are the shipbuilders going to Palace Square on the right bank? That's right, they are. Come on, let's have a salute. Chorus chanting. Isn't he suffer well goes to Maratov's greetings. Thank you to the shipbuilders. Even the watch commander on this joyous day left such liberty unnoticed. Suddenly the deafening bousy horn of the battleship sounded. To such a greeting the demonstrators of the shipyard responded with a friendly rasping ear a a a a a It came Nello to the Baltic seas. Muthy sailing mothers. It's not known who sounded the horn. They said it was one of the delivery crew of the plant, 
Many thought that it was done by machinists and stokers to thank the workers for their selfless labor. Well, the workers of Leningrad factories deserved such an unusual greeting. All the days while the Marat was standing on the Neva, the crowds on the embankments and on the bridge thinned only at night. My wife and her brother Vasily and I went to admire the battleship. A oh, powerful and beautiful ship, says Vasily. Volodya, show me where the navigator's cabin is, Zoya asks. You, do you see the first tower? There's a round one behind it. That's the combat deckhouse. There's a glazed cover around the deckhouse. At the level of this glazing, almost adjacent to the combat deckhouse, is the navigator's room. See? It's like... You like the ship? I like the ship, but I don't like the fact that you'll be away from it for a long time. When Marat was at the factory, you didn't come home very often. And if you go sailing, you'll be gone for a long time. What can I say to my favorite woman in such a situation? We won't see each other very often indeed. I just sighed. May day has passed. Marat went to Kronstadt, on the great raid, to practice ship organization and single training. Lev Mikhailovich Gala, commander of the battleship division, raised his flag with two stars of the senior flagship. There began endless, day and night, training at battle stations of all combat units, then exercises of each unit. The matter was crowned with a ship-wide exercise under the direction of the chief mate. At that time, the exo was I.V. Kellner. Bolshevik underground, he served in the Saris Navy. On submarines participated in the struggle for Soviet power. In the Civil War, graduated from a special course of the Naval Academy, Kellner had never before served on large warships, did not know all the specifics of service on a battleship, where the number of crew far exceeds a thousand people. The senior gunnery officer was Slava Melnikov, a.k.a. the first deputy Exo Melnikov, was also a graduate of the Franz Naval School, only he graduated a year earlier than me. We knew each other well from the school, and on the battleship we became even closer. Slava at night, taking a part, mastered the firing instruments and I.D. the American direction finder. Both he and I always had extra screws, nuts and springs when assembling, because of which we had to start all over again. Once, when the Exo was absent, Melnikov called me to his cabin. My tomorrow Friday, you'll be on duty on the ship. I want to do a big cleaning on Saturday, according to all the rules of battleship art. You know the battleship service. You know the ship. You've got a keen eye. You do your duty as ship's officer with zeal. Do you understand why I'm making you duty officer? I do. I like the idea. In fact, in your towers, especially at the central post, and we navigators at the posts, not to mention the central one, Everything is cleaned, cleaned, but on the lower deck, in the living and service premises we should wish for better. On Saturday, after the tea party as it was supposed to be, the big cleaning started. The upper deck was scrubbed with sand, superstructures were washed with soap. Inside the ship on each post, in all rooms all painted was washed, metal was scrubbed. It's about 11.0 commanders, heads of compartments reported on the end of cleaning. I went with a flashlight, examined every nook. Every Krevix, I report to Melnikov that the cleaning is over. Good, the U.S. says the deputy XO with satisfaction. Let's go and check. The two of us walk along the lower deck, enter the living quarters, service rooms. Melnikov checks meticulously, opens even the lockers. Comrade on duty, looks. There is dirt in the corners under the gangway. It is possible to sign on the dining table. Order the superintendent to repeat the cleaning. If I notice dirt again, I won't fire anyone to Leningrad. Here's the communal deck, the most spacious place on the ship. I'm calm. There are no tricky nooks and crannies in it. And suddenly, you call this cleaning. Look here. Melnikov points to the space between the boiler shrouds, not covered with a sheet, back at the factory. This hole from the deck is almost one and a half meters high. I come up, shine my flashlight, indeed. Garbage left by the workers. You don't check well, comrade on duty. Melnikov scolds me seriously in the presence of the commander, the head of the compartment and other commanders. Order to repeat the inspection. Not a single person will not be dismissed to shore until everything is not brought to the proper for the battleship look. And so on all over the ship. Dinner was delayed. No one in the wardroom but the mechanics. Everyone went to their duties without a command. At last all the faults of the fitting out were corrected. Dinner was delayed by half an hour. Housekeepers, the ship's intelligentsia, who cleaned up their cabin badly, were not dismissed to Leningrad. 
After that, there was only talk about cleaning all day long on the tank. Some of them said that the senior gunner was being rampant in vain, others, and there were more and more of them, approved of Melnikov's actions. I was, of course, offended that I had to pay for the sins of the storeroom which I had received so publicly from the deputy exo, but what can you do? I felt that I was also to blame. Melnikov was an excellent comrade, a highly educated sailor artillerist. True, sometimes coming out of the meridian, he could peso as well, but no one could take offence at him for a long time. He was a just man. Battleship's artillerymen were at their best. Their father Melnikov enjoyed unquestionable authority. Marat in the fleet was distinguished by its artillery achievements, won fleet prizes. After the commander ordered me to deal with mobilization documents as well, I was left alone in the cabin, as there was no other place to work with such documents. There was little consolation in this. Living together, there was at least someone to talk to. And now the only interlocutor is the telephone. Standing in Kronstadt, you can talk to Leningrad, to Lugaguba, to Krasnaya Gorka, even to the brig. One of the days, or rather evenings, during the anchorage in Lushkaya Guba, I was working on the next roll of our cadrille on the Seskarsky player. There was a small exercise. We shot, we were shot at, we were attacked, we dodged, and all this on the Seskarsky patch. In order to understand what, when and how the enemy did, what and how we answered him, we had to make tracing from the map in the course of actions. Old courses were erased to see the one we were following. The poor map lost its face from the rubber band, and in other places it shone with splotches. The norms of consumption of maps of this area were exceeded long ago, and each new copy had to be snatched from hydrographers with a fight. I am sitting, sorting out, making report tracing according to all rules of navigational art, depicting the course angles of attack, maneuvering and firing of both sides. I work with multicolored ink to make the picture more visible. Usually our report documents on the navigational part were the basis of documents compiled by the division and fleet headquarters for passing. We did not want to lose our marks, and it meant that the junior navigator had to work hard. Suddenly the door opened without knocking and Dmitri Polyakov entered. Are you still working? What kilometer of tracing paper are you finishing? Take a break, dear worker, take a break. He smiles kindly as always, his eyes full of slyness. Well done for coming in. I was glad. And I came to see you, Volodya, on business. Dima became serious at once. Really? What business? They say that you've been pecking your nose on watch. Will you tell me what's the reason? The reason is simple. I want to sleep every day, but I can't. Don't think I'm complaining. Not at all. Life is surprisingly interesting. I want to do as much useful work as possible. Listen, Volodya, how many workloads do you have? Navigator's office, commander of a group of small sectors, ship scout mobilizer, on the party line, member of the collective bureau, head of political classes with petty officers, editor of the newspaper. How does Romanovsky see it? Chandramovsky demands that during my official time I should be engaged in service, navigational affairs. As a specialist and a senior officer, he's right. That's why I don't get enough sleep. Dima left. We talked and it seemed to be easier to feel better. Now let's get to work. There's no waiting for calcs and the newspaper too. From that time on, our nicest ship's doctor began to take an interest in my health. Feeling that such a subject was not to my liking, one day when he and I were alone in the cabin saloon, he angrily said to, So you know, when I see fit, I'll just send you away to the resort. That's it. And Vasilev and Kamensky and anyone else. And Dimochka Polyakov himself. Is he working less than me? No less. So the resort can wait. Tis every day while anchored, the helmsman practiced throwing the handlot, holding between the fingers of the tiller. With all your might, spin the weight in the vertical plane parallel to the board, release the tiller, and the job is done. The lot flew carrying away the lot line with markings on meters or feet. However, not everyone managed this operation well. After all, the lead weight of the hand lot weighed more than one kilogram. They trained hard, and in the fall at the competitions the indicators of helmsmen in throwing the lot, in the speed of manufacturing to the action of the mechanical lot Thompson, were the best in the fleet, such as Zimian threw the lot far beyond 70 meters. Several times a week there were trainings on, controlling the rudder from various posts, central, navigational, aft fighting deckhouse, aft navigational tiller compartment. As a rule, 
The switches on the switchboard were made by Galonikov. He also indicated with an Electra sensor on which side to put the rudder. Actually, he was the chief conductor and trainer. Galonikov is a remarkable and authoritative person. He served on the ship for more than ten years. Class steersman in any conditions leads the ship as on a string. His character and calmness can be envied. So, a man of great strength, savvy, strong-willed, benevolent. As a junior commander educator, he was simply irreplaceable. Teaching was his vocation, as they say, God's gift. He had tact and patience, punctuality and exactingness too. He loves his service and performs it perfectly. His subordinates, and not only his subordinates, respect him. He is a communist, a member of the collective bureau. Such a chief foreman is a faithful assistant and a reliable support. Behind him is like behind a stone wall. Each departure to the sea was accompanied, as a rule, by trainings on blind steering, as the helmsmen used to say. It became a habit. It came to the point that they entered the large roadstead of Kronstadt along the narrow fairway, controlling the rudders from the lower posts. Galonikov was the ace of his trade, ready to take control every second. He also christened sailing under control from other posts aerobatic, aerobatic. The helmsman had a sporting excitement. This was facilitated by the fact that in the cockpit were posted indicators, with what accuracy kept the course of this or that helmsman, though friendly but still criticism. We are standing in Lushkaya Guba. Clear day. It is so quiet and smooth that the shores and ships can't look into the water mirror. We take off the anchor to go to the same Seskarsky plek. In the most complacent mood I walk on the bridge, take a bearing, determine the plek. Me, junior navigator. Fog. Comes the voice of Vadim Ivanovich in the intercom. What fog when it's a clear day? Golonikov quickly enters the navigator's cabin, closes the porthole and locks the door. I'm left alone with the ticking, clicking and buzzing instruments, from the consciousness that the battleship goes crooked fairway, having a ten-meter draft, at which the slightest mistake threatens to land on one of the many cans, I became hot, die and... Junior navigator soon turn. Comes the calm voice of the commander. Nine minutes and forty-five seconds. Not even half a minute passed. The same question again. And it went on and on until we got out in the clear. I'm sick of the commander with his endless how long before we turn. At every departure, if visibility on the sea was decent, he would sigh. Junior navigator Fogg, I was indescribably angry at the commander thinking that he was picking on me. But one day when the next junior navigator Fogg, it was over, Ivanov, entering the deckhouse in the most benevolent tone, smiling, said, you're doing quite well. I'm glad of your success. I stood disarmed, confused, not knowing what to say. Well done firing anti-mine caliber. Artillerymen are birthday boys. And everyone's in a good mood. Following the Luger, we are approaching the Kupor Bay. Having settled down at the direction finder, with pleasure I smoke a pipe. And suddenly, oh, junior navigator, fog. I managed to take three bearing and, having snuck into the navigator's cabin, I quickly put them on the map and determine the place of the ship, and only then it comes to my consciousness. The battleship must be conducted by a cunningly shaped, as we called it, fairway, bypassing all sorts of underwater dangers. Acquaintance with any of them threatened the heaviest accident. Not only that, but in front of the whole fleet we had to put the Marat in the most accurate way on its anchor place. Usually for this purpose, we used specially installed sash marks on the shore. Now everything had to be done blindly and though I had already got used to junior navigator Fogg, and gradually gained some confidence in driving by calculation, this task was not an easy one. Junior navigator, what course to the first boy? 197, halfway. I can see from the instruments that the ship is on course. 17 and a quarter minutes to turn. I shout, without waiting for a request, into the intercom on the bridge. We're on a new course. Boy on the left, half a cable. Three minutes before the second boy to report. Commander orders. See, the required time has passed. I report. I look at the repeater and see. The ship has rolled sharply to the left. A navigator's office. Boy directly on the bow. Coordinate to the left. Lie down on the recommended course. The ship described a 30 degree coordinate to the left. Wind four points starboard. Then we'll have to adjust course. On the bridge, 10 degrees to starboard. In one minute, the recommended course. Chip is now on a course to the anchorage. A little time passes. I'm already unbearably hot. The most important moment is coming. 
It is necessary to get to the anchorage point. Kolonikov is on the helm. Everything is safe here. It's my friend Lag. Don't let me down. All hope is in you. The operation navigator slow down. What course to the anchorage? Asks the commander in a completely calm voice. Three cables away to warn. The course is the same. Else, woman, we gave the smallest turn. I see by the lag. We I answer as calmly as possible, though all tense and my heart beats faster. And soon I report. On the bridge three cables left. Junior navigator, what course? The same. It's time to stop. Navigator's office, stop running. Engines to the rear. Report every quarter cable. On the bridge, stay on the intercom. One and a half cables to go. One cable, three quarters. Time to back off, half. Reverse, one quarter, period. Five to seven seconds later, the anchor chain rattled. We're anchored. I must be burning up. Junior navigator, no fog. Congratulations on your arrival. Opening the door of the navigator's cabin, says a satisfied, smiling Vadim Ivanovich. And how could I be angry with such a commander? This is the best commander in the entire Baltic fleet. Such thoughts whirled through my head. Let's see, come out, come out on the bridge. Make up your minds. Three depths on the fair lead. I hurried to the bridge to determine the place by two horizontal angles in the most accurate way. Galolnikov entered the deck house. I can feel that he's worried too. Hmm. How did the place turn out? Now we'll draw. Look, we've swung over the transom by twenty meters. After dinner, all the friends, Polyakov Vasiliev, Slizskoy, Kamensky, gathered in the cabin as if by conspiracy. When everyone was already assembled, the door opened and Kolobok rolled in L. That was the name of the ship's chemist, Korolev, my schoolmate. Nice. One at a time, Dima commanded in a loud whisper. Let's congratulate you on your arrival at the point. Chorus quietly chanted by all. You think we don't realize how hard it's been for you? You think we weren't worried about you? Yes, we did. Well, you did well, you did not fail, our cohort did not disgrace. We won't pump you, the ceiling doesn't allow us, but we'll squeeze you, concludes Polyakov. On the occasion of safe arrival to the point there was an evening tea. The messengers set the table decorated with everyone's favorite Kopchenka and Halva. A young men's tea feast was held. Jokes and laughter did not cease until bedtime. On alarm, the navigator's place, in the central navigator's post, where, having dived into the round neck of the hatch, you fly down the vertical gangway eighteen meters, barely holding on to the handrails with your hands. At this post, in fact, and navigational and combat laying for the enemy, data course angle and distance are automatically transmitted from the neighboring central artillery post. A marvel of technology of that time. Our post is good, but after half an hour from high bout in 45 degree, temperature sweat pours from you in streams. Ship exercises last for hours on the move, and for hours we work at our central post. Our assistants are instruments. What they say, the junior navigator depicts on the map. It's good if you have time to take a few bearing on the alarm. Having put them on the map, you get the very stove, from which goes the whole navigator's dance ending with the alarm. Then, having written down the calculated place, you rush to the bridge to compare it with the place, determined by your own navigational method, and to evaluate the accuracy of calculation. At first, all this brought noticeable grief. Then, when I learned to take into account the angular speed, turns, the position of the rudder in this case, the size of the diameter of the circulation depending on the course and wind, when I made various templates, helping to take into account all the factors, the matter went better, and often established depending on the range of navigation standards overlapped. In proportion to this, confidence was gained and professional skill was polished. Probably at least one third of the campaign time was spent at the central post. Track calculation on the navigator's watch. Calculation at the central post. Counting all around, of course, I did not want to be lagging behind to pass before my chief. Once we were returning from a fleet campaign in the Middle Baltic, under the flag of the fleet commander MVV Viktorov. Already in the throat of the Gulf of Finland, the weather began to deteriorate, and on the meridian of Revel there was an impenetrable fog of such density that at night, when we passed Gogland, the commander, in order to avoid violation of territorial waters by the ships, ordered all of us to anchor and show our place. In the navigator's deckhouse, there were three of us navigators, flagship of the fleet VVP Novitsky and two ships. P. Novitsky and two ships. 
three navigators, three different places in the numbering. Divergence between places, a few cable meters. Novitsky came to our map, on which Romanovsky's place and mine did not converge. He looked at it and said nothing. We spent the night on the bridge, all awake, waiting for the moment when it will be possible to determine the exact location of the battleship. All the ships are on watch in the marching mode. Machines are warmed up. Each ship is ready for immediate shooting from anchor. It is the fifth hour of the morning. Fog from the breeze, slightly lifted, became visible hull October Revolution and the hull of two destroyers. Novitsky and Romanovsky went to the bridge. In about forty minutes the Rodsher lighthouse appeared. Three by vertical angle and bearing determine the place. We repeat the determination by distance taken by rangefinder and bearing. Our surveyed locations are virtually identical. Mine is the closest to the surveyed one. Apparently, hours of training in calculus have not gone to waste. Not bad, very good, says Novitsky, addressing me. You can be promoted. I feel extremely awkward. I can see how what Novitsky said was not to Romanovsky's liking. Novitsky and Romanovsky were both excellent specialists in their field, and it's all the more annoying that they didn't always find common ground, and it all started with nothing. At Novitsky's suggestion, a small cabin, a combat direction finding station, was equipped on the foremast, above the signal bridge. It was inactive because, except for cables, there was nothing in it, as there was no combat direction finder in it. During one of the campaigns, Novitsky expressed the idea of automatic transmission of bearing to the central post in the form of a light line. The campaign was over. Everyone forgot about the direction finder, except Romanovsky. For two weeks, Andrian Adamovich was drawing something, working hard with a logarithmic ruler. He was fluent in English, well versed in mathematics, had a great design mind. Novitsky's idea began to materialize from drawings we moved to the material design. Navigational electricians, ship's workshop started working. In this case, interested, took part senior mechanic Zanuck. A month or two later, the direction finder, created by his own efforts, and the whole scheme worked. And in another ten days, everything was brought to a working condition. Novitsky was somewhat hurt that his idea had been carried out without consulting him. And, the simplicity in the relationship between these two interesting people disappeared. Today is the prize firing of the main caliber. The artillerymen have been preparing for it, sparing no effort. Commander's guides practiced for hours on Krylov's device, which swings the target in two dimensions, up and down, right and left. The rangefinders both day and night, at anchor and at sea, systematically conducted drills and exercises. Our neighbor, the Central Artillery Post, also conducted more than a hundred drills and exercises. The whole crew in the name of the main thing, artillery combat, worked the whole summer campaign, spared no effort. All course firing was carried out with a high score, and finally came the hour of examination, prize firing for the fleet championship. The party, Komsomol and formation meetings were held on the battleship. Everything and everyone mobilized for the shooting. Swiss went to sea. The crew, from the commander to any Red Fleet, became greyer, not even tank. As the bells of the loud battle rang, the horn players played, announcing the battle alarm. Everyone on the upper deck was blown away. Keeping in mind the three bearing taken, I rolled to my central post, instantly laid a bearing. We're in position, report. Nitya Central, navigators to the battle is made. At the post, the silence is broken only by the discordant chatter of devices. We can hear the characteristic clicking of sensors from the command millimeter post. So the target is caught. The helmsman enters data into a special table every minute. I put them on the map. The combat laying has begun. Well done, rangefinders. Caught the target at the limit of visibility. Two minutes passed. A howler sounded. The ship shuddered from the salvo. What a Milnikov. He opened fire also at the limit of firing practical shells. Well done, Slava. A few deafening salvos, the ship's hull shuddering from them, and silence, and then the alarm goes off. I ask the central artillery pus, why did they stop firing? No target, replies the chief officer in a cheerful voice. Not yet realizing what the matter is, I take the map with a map tables of records, and to the bridge. From the bridge I notice that the battleship goes to the tugboat, which has something dangling on the tug behind the stern. Well, show me your product, Master of Calculus. Where did the firing begin and where did it end? Asks Novitsky in a cheerful voice. 
I spread the map on the navigator's table. The flagship navigator of the fleet scrutinizes the battle pad, checks with his notes in the navigator's notebook. Not bad, not bad at all, just like the artilleryman. It is gratifying that the navigator was not let down and with his score helped excellent shooting. More than half of the posts which held the sailcloth, knocked down part of the logs of the shield itself is cut. From the destroyer towing the shield, transmits semaphore his observations of the group, recording flights and underflight. Most of the shells hit the shield or lay with small flights. It seems that the whole crew of the battleship has poured out on the upper deck and is looking at the remains of the shield with interest. That's how they've dismantled it, someone said enthusiastically and in surprise. The fleet commission counted all the artillery and other points affecting the firing, especially the navigational ones. Marat was awarded the prize. It was announced to the ship's crew gathered on the ute. The ship's radio newspaper told about it, naming the distinguished ones the newspaper devoted to this event. At the meeting, the glad tidings were greeted with a powerful hurrah. Koki fed the crew with a super excellent dinner. In the wardroom, the chief artilleryman was presented with a solid cake with the inscription. The cake was decorated with chocolate shells. There were also competitions in the navigational part. Eight hours of restless manoeuvring, as we jokingly called them, junior navigator on the signal, having determined visually the place of the ship, took his place at the central post and for eight hours was carrying out a pad on the number of various combat manoeuvres. When I at the signal abort got out on the bridge and determined my place, it differed from the calculated one by less than two cables. Novitsky, having compared my data with his own, said, Excellent. It is necessary, it is necessary to promote you, Vladimir Alexandrovich. Again, he is with his promotion. I don't need it. The service is going interesting. The people on the ship are wonderful. You can't wish for anything better. Seeing my dissatisfaction, Novitsky turned the conversation to the indicators achieved by helmsmen and navigational electricians. These indicators were much higher than on other ships. The navigational service of the Marat came in first place. Romanovsky was awarded excellent binoculars, and I received a six-volume book of the works of V.I. Lenin. Lenin. It seemed that we should be happy, but there was a worm eating away at me. One day Dmitry Polyakov came to see me. Why are you so gloomy? We won first place, we got awards. What else do you want? That's right. But tell me. Why does Novitsky talk about my progress in the presence of the chief navigator every time? It bothers me somehow. Dima had no time to answer me, as there was a knock on the door and a messenger came in. Hmm. Comrade navigator, you are called by the division commander. Previously, Gala never called me to him. Being in the navigator's cabin, greeted me, interested in navigational matters. But now he calls me himself. Why would he do that? Lev Mikhailovich Gala was an example for all of us. He was a true knight of duty. He did not go ashore for months, and went to Leningrad once in two months. Everyone without exception respected his division commander for his intelligence, knowledge and respectful attitude to people, from the private to the commander of the ship. And yet, why is he calling me? What will it bring me, joy or grief? I knocked on the cabin to the commander of the division. I enter, emphasized neatness in everything. Nothing superfluous on the desk. No ashtrays. Lev Mikhailovich himself did not smoke, and he had no smokers. There are many books on the shelves, some of them in foreign languages. There is also fiction. Hello, Vladimir Alexandrovich, says Gala affably and immediately gets down to business. In this winter, helmsmen and signalmen for the division will be trained on the Marat. We want to entrust this school to you, especially since the ship's navigational service took the prize. How do you see it? I don't have much experience in this kind of work. Although modesty is a man's virtue, you're making a big deal out of it. Judging by your record in the small sector group, you've had some experience and not bad. In two weeks' time, we'll have a young addition. Think about what you need to organize training. You can buy the missing things in Leningrad. Come back in two or three days with your plans. Do you have any questions? May I come back with all my questions at the time you specified? You're welcome. Have a good day. Before I could return to my quarters, Polyakov showed up. Well, with or on the shield. I don't know about the shield, but about the school of helmsmen and signalmen, it's clear. You see, this school is being organized right on the battleship, and Lev Mikhailovich is putting me in charge of it. I tried to explain to him about my lack of experience, 
but no way. The order is to report the plans in two or three days, and in ten days to start training. Nappy new addition, Volodia. Another load has been added, so you're doing well if the bosses trust you. Enough with the teasing. I resolutely stepped forward, intending to throw Dimka on the bed and wring his sides. Our fuss was stopped by the signal for dinner. We washed up in my cabin and went to the table. New Year's Eve had long passed. Working at the school turned out to be very exciting. Not only specialties were taught there, but at the same time illiteracy was eliminated. Interesting were the political classes on a special program. At work, we did not notice how March came, and then April was not far off. One of the March days after dinner, I was sitting in my cabin, reading newspapers. Suddenly there was a knock at the door. The kindest soul enters, the senior doctor. Didn't bother you. Last time, I remember, I promised to send him to the sanatorium as soon as I saw that the navigator editor had reached the point. My word is firm. Here are two vouchers. From surprise, I was confused. The care of our ship doctor touched me extremely. Neither my wife nor I have ever been to any resorts before. Thank you for your concern, but I must consult with my better half. That's right. Consult, but not for long. From my cabin, I called Leningrad to Skux, where my wife worked. We thought, guessed, and decided to take a chance. When else will we have to visit Yelta Sanatorium? And two hours later, there was a phone call. Meet you, comrade Andreev. Come and see me. Why the commander needed me, I can't understand. Things seem to be going well in the sector at school, too. I'm off. I knock on the cabin. Ivanov invites me to sit down and starts without any introduction. You've been serving us well, Comrade Andrev. We are sorry to part with you, but you are assigned to the Far East. The situation there now is tense. There are armed conflicts with the Chinese. The Japanese do not stop their provocations on our Far Eastern borders, which must be strengthened in every possible way and quickly. You will hand over your navigational duties to the second junior navigator. I handed over to the commander all the documents on mobilization and military intelligence. I also handed over my duties. I returned to the cabin and saw a knot tied with a napkin on the desk. In the bund there was a full set of plates, a cut glass and saucer, sea spoons, a knife and fork. It's the messengers seeing off the junior navigator. Nobody taught them, nobody ordered them. They did it out of the kindness of their hearts. There was something to get excited about. Before I could remember, my friends came running. Where to what position? Brothers, I don't know anything myself. I was ordered to report tomorrow morning to the Electromine School to the head of the Echelon. I said goodbye to the helmsmen and navigators. I gave them my award, a six-volume book of V.I. Lenin. I gave away everything I could as souvenirs. She made the closest friends we walked till dawn. The messengers gave the navigator his favorite tea for the last time. Having firmly shaken hands with his friends, he took a suitcase with some luggage and a gift from the Vestas and went to the upper deck. Now, in a few seconds, I'll take the last steps and farewell my native Marat. It is sad, oh, how sad to part with the ship, with comrades, with whom I lived and worked so well. I said goodbye to the watch commander, Vasily Kondratyev. Don't forget us, Volodya. Write us how it is in the east. One last firm handshake, and I'm on my way to the gangway. A panting Golonikov rises on the stern gangway from the shore. Let's take the suitcase. I'll see you off. We reached the electric mine school in eloquent male silence. Then they hugged each other. Never nice life. Seven feet under the keel. Golownikov turned and, slouching a little, quickly went to the ship. Having opened the wicket of the massive gate, I stepped into the unknown, 